Our final toaster and gentle roaster is one of our busiest alums. It's amazing how he does this. This guy is the rare talent of being the voice of major college football and men's basketball program, the University of Cincinnati Bearcats, as well as a National Football League team, the Cincinnati Bengals. He is also one of the best golfers I've ever met. A little pressure for you there, Dan. <laughs> the connection with Sean goes all the way back to Syracuse. Here's Dan Horde. There are people here tonight that have golfed with me that now realize that John Nicholson has not golfed with very many good players. John, I do appreciate the introduction, but thanks a lot for having me follow Bill Raftery, who is very high on the list of people that you do not want to follow at a speaking engagement. The last time I saw Bill, was when he was inducted into the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Hall of Fame last year. And I was thrilled to attend because I was not able to be there for his previous Hall of Fame induction ceremony. That's when Bill was chosen for the Liver Hall of Fame. <laughs> I've read that there are nearly 2,000 Irish pubs in New York City. Seven would still be in business if not for Bill. I'm a 1985 graduate of Syracuse University, and I'm proud to say I have a unique distinction in WAER history of the thousands of students who cut their broadcasting teeth at FM 88, including Dick Clark, Ted Koppel, and the great sportscasters that we've heard from tonight. I am the only student who signed on for the very first time by saying his own name wrong. I remember it vividly. I was a freshman at the time. I was a member of the Sour Citrus Society basketball pep band. Yes, I know it's hard to believe, but I was a band geek. And one particular night my freshman year, I was asked to be the stat guy for a WAER broadcast of a Syracuse Boston College basketball game at the Carrier Dome. So I ditched the pep band uniform of the orange and blue rugby shirt and the stretchy blue pants, a look that was a magnet for the co-eds and put on my only suit and tie to look like a professional, like we all did at WAER, before reporting to duty on press row to assist the two upperclassmen who would be broadcasting that game, Gary Apple and Glenn Sutherland. Now, I don't know if it's still the case, maybe some current students can fill me in tonight, but back then, the WAER pregame show was named Countdown to Tip-Off, and it included a four to five minute segment that was an interview with somebody who happened to be on site that night. So it might be a former coach, might be a former player, basically anybody interesting that you could find on Press Row. So on my first night as a member of the WAER broadcast crew, we spotted former Celtics coach Tommy Heinsohn, who was there that night to broadcast the game on TV. So about an hour before the game, Gary and Glenn asked me if I wanted to do the pregame interview. I said, of course, this is my opportunity to make my WAER debut. So I picked up our 200-pound cassette recorder. <laughs> Technology has come a long way. I introduced myself to Tommy Heinsohn and asked if he had a few minutes to do an interview with student radio. And Tommy said, these officials are terrible. They're killing Paul Pierce. <laughs> well, he did say that, but uh, that was at a different time. He actually said, sure, kid, I can do the interview. So I hit play and record. I did the countdown that I had been trained to do as a Syracuse University student. Three, two, one, slight pause. And then I said the following. Welcome back to Countdown to Tip Off here on FM 88. I'm Dan Hord. <laughs> now my last name has one syllable. It is not difficult to pronounce, but I managed to butcher it in my WAER debut. That was 34 years ago, and to this day, my WAER buddies, including the person we are honoring tonight, generally call me Dan Hill Horde. 
If that was the worst thing that happened to me in my freshman year at Syracuse, the best thing was when I went to the freshman orientation meeting at WAER and got assigned to be a writer for a sophomore named Sean McDonough. That's how it worked in student radio back then. Hopefully it still does. You got assigned to an upperclassman who would basically teach you the radio basics, how to operate the equipment, how to write a three minute sports cast, how to sign on and sign off. In Sean's case, how to walk to Marshall Street immediately after your shift. <laughs> These were all crucial lessons. So I began working with Sean and he probably didn't know it at the time, but he almost ended my broadcasting career before it began because after listening to, him to, listening to him call games, do sports reports, and host talk shows as a sophomore, I remember thinking, holy crap, is everybody this good? Fortunately, it didn't take too long to realize that I was the norm and Sean was the exception. While most of us wannabe sports announcers were getting badly needed on-air experience, developing our broadcasting style, and in one case, learning how to pronounce his own last name, Sean was a network level announcer as a college student. He sounded and he looked like he was 50. <laughs> Some things haven't changed. Now that is not to say that Sean never made a mistake. I have a WAER blooper tape in my possession that could, use, that could be used to blackmail every student that appeared on the air between 1981 and 1985. In Sean's case, there was no foul language or anything too embarrassing, but he did have a pretty good blooper during an NCAA tournament basketball game. Sean tossed it to a commercial, and the board operator back at the station wasn't paying attention and did not run the spot. So everybody tuned in to FM 88 that night, heard Sean give the score, and then say the following. You're listening to NCAA Tournament Basketball here on FM 88. You're listening to roast, Wolf Down Your Roast Beef Sandwich Time on FM 88. Hey, did they play the commercial? <laughs> so even when he wasn't trying to, Sean taught me a valuable broadcasting lesson. Always assume the mic is hot. But the mistakes have been few and far between in Sean's broadcasting career. If you were, were to do a poll of sports fans right now and ask them to name their favorite play-by-play -play announcer, I'm guessing the most common answers would be the people that have the good fortune to call the biggest games. Al Michaels, Jim Nance, Joe Buck, and one of Syracuse University's all-time best, Mike Tirico, and they are all superb announcers. But I have always maintained that if you conducted a poll of working play-by-play -play announcers, the people that do this for a living, and ask them to name the best in the business, Sean McDonough would be at or near the top of the list. And now that he is the voice of Monday Night Football, Sean is going to get the national recognition that he so richly deserves. Nobody in this industry combines humor and information better than Sean McDonough. My wife Peg describes him as the funniest person in any room that he is ever in, and that quick wit is on full display whenever he is behind the mic. But Sean has all the skills that make up a great play-by-play -play announcer. He is an outstanding storyteller. He understands the games that he is calling and can communicate the strategy in plain language to the viewer or listener. He has a flair for the dramatic and always nails the big moments. And he has a thick, luxurious head of hair. <laughs> that is another lesson I learned from Sean, just say no to rugs. It is no exaggeration to say that I owe my career in large part to Sean McDonough. When I was a senior at Syracuse, I succeeded him as the radio voice of the Syracuse Chiefs. In baseball terms, the drop-off was similar to when Ryan Miner replaced Cal Ripken at third base for the Baltimore Orioles. But it was an incredible opportunity for me, and the biggest reason why I got the job is that Sean recommended me to the general manager. 
He has recommended me for several jobs since, including making calls that I didn't ask him, ask him to make and only learned about after I landed the job. If you are really, really lucky, you have a friend like Sean McDonough, somebody that always makes you laugh, somebody that can laugh at himself, somebody that would do anything, and I mean anything, for a friend. Sean, I love you. I can't wait to spend my Monday nights watching you this fall. On behalf of all of us who are lucky enough to call you a friend, congratulations on being this year's Glickman Award winner.